Welcome to today's plenary session. This session is particularly special as it has been allocated by the WFOT and the Scientific Committee to the third keynote speaker slot on the program. In addition, to the best of my knowledge, it is the first time that a panel of occupational therapy users has been included in a WFOT Congress program. At the outset, I would like to acknowledge a number of people who have assisted and supported our presenters in preparing for today's session. I would like to thank Donovan Adonis, Frank Cronenberg, Avril Isaacs, Fadia Hamaldin, Nafisa Abdullah, Adiba Hamid, and Maddie Duncan. <laughs> this session is structured as follows. Each of the four speakers will address us. There will be, then be question and answer time. I would ask you to think about um, questions as the presenters address you so that we make best use of that time. And then we have a little surprise for you to close the session. Over the past few days, we have had many of our colleagues share with us their research, their work, and the insights that they have come to as they practice our beloved profession. This session is particularly exciting as we get to look at the other side of the coin. How have people who have been exposed to occupational therapy directly or indirectly benefited from this exposure? What has the impact of occupational therapy been on their lives as individuals and or communities? I am hopeful that this session will also provide you with a glimpse into the realities of life for some of our people in South Africa, as well as the innovative work that South African occupational therapists are doing. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to our four presenters who truly represent voices from the field. On the far side, Daisy Mapila. <laughs> Next to her, Tandi Ngushelo. <laughs> the man in the middle, Maxwell Bokela. And next to him, Trakatili Dabula. And if you're wondering about the third gentleman on the stage, he is Temba Ntria, who will assist us with translation, should this be necessary. Thank you for joining us, Temba. You may be aware that there are 11 official languages in South Africa, one of many factors that highlights the diversity of our population. This means that there are many different ways of greeting people, depending on the language which they speak. All four of our presenters are Isikosa speakers, and the appropriate greeting in Isikosa is Molweni. Please join me in greeting and welcoming our presenters. Molweni. 
Now, I am not a also speaker, and with apologies to any linguists who may be present, I am going to have a jolly good try this morning. Indiani bulela nivumeli ubalapa namtlanje. Ababantu zi occupational therapists basuka kwitlabati lonke. Uninzi luabu luazi gandlingli ngufuyu nemengeni yokutlala e Africa. Ukanya ngomze benzi Owenziwa, the occupational therapists in Mzanzi, Africa. Imbunisu yenu, ibalu lekili kakulu, ngezi zatu ezembini. Umtolo ngamye, uyakuniku umbunise, ngentraki zomoni babantu, balapa in Mzanzi, Africa. Umbunisu ngamye, uzaku bunisa ndlela ubomi baku, ukanye babantu obameleyo bakukumiseke njani zi oti. Ndiktinga ukuba nine sibindi gakulu, kubo nie navuma uku jongana naba pula puli, Aban Ninzi in Ingabaziu, Nabelani Nabu, and Gamabali Wenu. Nkosi Gakulu. Our first speaker is Mr. Maxwell Bokrela a mental health service user. He has been followed up by the forensic unit at Falkenberg Hospital, a psychiatric hospital in the Western Cape, for the past 16 years. He will be taking you on a journey of his life story and will convey how, how he has learned to manage his mental illness effectively. He will also be reflecting on how participating in occupational therapy has facilitated his recovery and some of the achievements he has attained through his participation in work and learning programs. Maxwell has a great appreciation of what it takes to continue on a path of progress despite his challenges he has a clear vision for his future. Maxwell. Thank you. Good morning for all in the World Conference. My name is Maxwell Tunzimbotlaila. I was born in 1977 at Willow Vale in Transkei. My father was a soldier, and my mother is an entrepreneur who's selling different items in order to survive. My mother and my father were not married, and I was the only child in their relationship. My mother was married to by another guy afterwards, which the guy has six kids from her, four boys and two girls. After my mother married to the guy, they moved to Cape Town. Me, I was left with my grandmother, my father's brother, and my father, that they were supportive to me. On my childhood, I was like to play kids' game, and also went to church, and I was also helpful at home, because I was working in garden, cleaning the yard. Also because of that, my neighbors were interested for that, that they used to ask me to help them by by cleaning their garden and sometimes their cars, where they were giving money or items like sweet or clothes to say thank you to me. In 1986, my father passed away, and after this, my, my father's brother was also diagnosed as a mental health user. Then I started to use drugs. 
all kinds of drugs like cannabis, which means Dacha. Then it is where I start to give problems to my family because I was not going to school every day, not going to church, because I am drunk, because I am drunk and also drugged. I also lose respect to the elders in the society. And the thing of using drugs was not because of stress or abuse. It was just the fun and not ideas. I was sent to many schools. The reason why my grandmother, she felt I had bad friends and because I was not passing. Because I was a politician, I was failed standard eight because the school I was the leader to stop corporal punishment. And when I repeat standard eight, then my results were unbelievable because I was in the stage of realizing what I want, to, I want, that is why I'm studying. That is also the year I went to the bush. As far as my culture, when you turn a certain age, 18, you have to become recognized as a man. I then go in initiation school where, where, whereby I become a man. It means, that means I can now discuss family issues as a man. They also teach me how to overcome my challenges as a man. My young brother of my father was also, my young brother of my father, he said he will offer everything that must be offered when the boy come from the bush. Things like clothes, shoes, and uniform, but he did not. I then decided to come to my mother in order I can start further and develop myself. Six months after I came to Cape Town, my grandmother passed away through traditional culture. So as an oldest boy, often of an old man in the family, I must be in the funeral. So I went back to Transkei in July for the funeral. After this, I tried to go back to complete my school in the Eastern Cape, but I failed again. I had no support from my young brother of my father, who said he gonna support me so I didn't have funds to go to school. And he decided that it will be better if I will go to stay by my mother again. So I moved, I moved once more to Cape Town in 2000 to try to find work while I, while I stay by my mother. At the end of the year, 2000, I set my family house on fire because I had argument with my mother and I was also using drugs and alcohol because I was angry, and I was angry because my father left policies for me. And when I said that I will never get from my father's family my policies, then I burned the house on fire because of angerness and caused the motion of, the, of, of, the, of drugs and drunkards. I was arrested, and then I went to Bosmo, Bosmo prison, and I was sent to Falkenberg being to be assessed on observation. I diagnosed by Professor Kaleski as a schizophrenia in 2002. I was now diagnosed with a mental illness and it made me think back to that time I was living in Butterworth with my grandmother. I remember a funny story that I used to hear. The funny story that I used to hear, the people, the nurses at the hospital, they used to send the people with a mental illness with a bucket, with a bucket, with a bucket which have holes to fill some water. And then if you realize that bucket is leaking, then you could to go to the society. But if you don't realize, it means that you're not. When I was in Ward 20, that is the maximum security ward, I started to work with OTs of Ward 20. The ward staff, they asked me what I was doing before I get admitted. I told them that I, I was working as a garden service with my stepfather. It is where they advised me to work an, at OT in Ward 20. I can, uh, in Ward 20, where I cannot find boring to be at Ward 20. I thought I would be only there for three weeks, so I was shocked to hear that I was, I will be, I was going to be there for a long time because I wanted to develop, I wanted to study. But being in, in the world kept me back, being the world that way kept me back. I did also, uh, also hear voices that will tell me things that were not happening. So I knew I was ill. Because why? With medication, I was calm and not angry all the time. Socially, I did not like 
it, I do not like it there. That is in World 20 because there was a lot of fighting. But I was not the, was, was not the part because I was looking for, uh, for a way forward. When I got transferred to Ward 11, the medium security ward, I started to work to ma with Madri. And she said, when the OT department opened, that is the big OT of Falkenberg, I will start there to work. Really, by January, I did. That is where I met another patient, also other OTs, OT staff members. Then I said to my, I am not used to, to sit when I, when I work. Can you organize something better? No matter, it's a garden. She said she will talk to Nazima. And Nazima said, I can work on the garden. That is where from the OT support work start for me. By 2003, I started to work on the farm or the Molen Vegetable Farm. And the same day, I was transferred to Ward 12, the minimum security ward, where I start to be under my OT's arena. I would work at many places, mostly for a few months, every year, but not for longer, because every time the drugs I was still using were creating problems for me, so I quit my jobs or the MDTs, they decide to take me out of work. My longest work I did manage was working for Woolworths for five years. Then, by 2011, 2011 Serena moved to work at UCT, where I was start work with Nafisa as my OT, when she must support for me. I said, I want to study further. Then she said, my problem is drugs. Then I told her that I can stop drugs. Really, September 2011, I stopped drugs without rehab by my own. Then my OT helped me to attend a computer literacy le le lectures courses for a week. After I completed this, it made me want to study more. My OT asked me if I want to try a learnership. I was just a little worried that I would not be able to cope because I was out of school for 13 years. But I started business subject at senior level in school, so I was not so worried. She then helped me to get onto a leadership with Boston College in Cape Town. When I get assessed by Boston College for the leadership that were offered, and I get 40% to be qualified to, be, to do the level one business practice leadership. They also at Boston test our memories in the first week where I write a test, that is a closed test, where I was going to get a 58%, so I knew I was going to be okay. Through doing the leadership, I was hoping to reach to my dreams of being a chartered accountant or a business management. However, when I complete, I was disappointed because there was no job that were offered for us. In the meantime, I started to do some casual jobs offered by OT, each cleaning up events or work for University of Cape Town, working with students to motivate others. My passion is to help not and motivate others. I then got a chance to do a second leadership to get a higher level that I can have more opportunities, like a level four equivalent to Madrid. The difference was you get a higher position if you on level four and your skills will be higher than compared to level one. For me, working with the patients, it was the worst life because we only, and to me, to work in the OT department, that is for, for OT, it was, we was only earned 10 rand a week. It made no difference, it was not made no difference in my life. So we encourage each other to work outside of the hospital. I graduated in 2016, and to me, it was a moment I never forget because I achieved something. It was a shock because I did not believe it was me after everything I experienced in my life, e.g. when I diagnosed of mental illness and also going to Bosnia. That day, my future looked brighter than Dima. Then from there, I volunteered at Friends of Falkenberg and it helped me to practice all my skills that I learned in my course. I learned how to be part of a team, 
It gave me a chance to help others and also to make new friends. I applied for internship at the hospital and I received a lot of support and encouragement from the friends of Falkenberg, OTs, and HR, and HR staff of Falkenberg. I had, I had no, I had to, I had to write tests, and was not always successful, but it was part of learning. I also, I, I also gained confidence and experience for the future interviews. Then, 2016 April, I started to get an internship of Friends of Falkenberg. That was one year internship. I practiced my skills, like answering the phone, making photocopies, assisting with management, with management of stock and equipment, keeping shop area tidy in order, and in order, help to serve customers, sorting and pricing, processing of orders. I also sit in, in staff meetings and help with the general office duties. I enjoy saving people the most. I like to see the smile on their face when I serve them. And I can, I can talk to the, and I can talk to them and encourage them. I enjoy this so much and do well with my job. So I, I talk to my manager of friends, Sandra, and she negotiated with Falkenberg Hospital for earning better than I used to get. That, that day, must offer me in turn with higher salary. Then in May 2017, I was accepted as an intern of Falkenberg Hospital, where I did my internship at Friends of and Friendly Shop. This internship gave me hope that I can dream about a life, a life side outside of Falkenberg Hospital. It gave me skills to be a proper job. It gave me skills to be in a proper job one day. It taught me about responsibility when you're in job. I get support from that staff of Friends of Falkenberg and my OT, and they encourage me to learn new things every day. I was included in being a motivational speaker at Friends of Falkenberg fundraising and to contribute to the strategic planning meeting for the year. Because I, start, I, I started to understand the friendly shop business well and could give good suggestions in how to make it even better. I'm happy to say that in, 2000, in 2018, the 2nd of May, I started work at Friends of Falkenberg as a staff member, as a permanent staff member. I am the assistant shop manager, which is a great... I, from there, I am assistant shop manager, which is, a, which is great because I can be financially independent and make choices for myself and plan my future. The place where I work, the friend shop, is a place where the patient and staff can buy things for themselves or their families. The patients feel safe there because we make it friendly for them. They can have a cup of coffee or sandwich so that they can also socialize instead of staying in the world the whole day. I was stayed at Comcare Trust, an NGO, where they provide accommodation for mental, people, for mental people with disability. I stayed there for four years. I moved out, of, I moved out a few months ago due to a dis, dis, dis agreement, disagreement. I am currently staying in what? At the hospital while I'm looking for other accommodation. I am well enough to stay on my own. So I look on the internet for accommodation while I'm waiting. I buy things. While I'm waiting, I buy things like furniture that will be needed on a house. One of my goals for the future is to have my family and to have my own business and also be a motiva motivational speaker for the young ones to show them what is good and what is bad. When I'm not working, I like to watch soccer and reading sports books. Family-wise, we live in peace. I visit my mother and my sister regularly. I also call them to find out how they are doing. I do not want to stay with them because my brother is on drugs and the environment is not good there. I can just say I am an intelligent man. I like intelligent people. And I
And also, I am a progressive man. I like pro progressive people. They are also motivated people because I like motivated people. I thank you. <laughs> Hello, I'm Maxwell Mortaila. Uh, I'm, I'm working at Friends of Urban Bank and I was diagnosed as, as schizophrenic and I was admitted in 2003 and now I'm living in Observatory. I'm doing my internship at Friends Shop with Elaine. We are going to use it to work it outside in the commercial world. I appreciate every people can help us by donation in the friend shop. Thank you. Maxwell, thank you very much. That is some story. We do appreciate your sharing it with us. I've come unhooked. <laughs> Our second presenter, Takatili Dabula, was born and bred in Mount Freer in the Eastern Cape. <clears throat> His clan is Zulu and he also speaks Isitrosa. He is a prince in his clan because he comes from the royal house. He achieved matric education and has completed many short courses in topics like air conditioning, chronic poverty, and land reform. He has had, held part-time employment with various non-profit organizations. He has also worked as a research assistant for researchers from the University of the Western Cape, the University of Cape Town, and the University of Adelaide in Australia. He has two children. He likes to serve his community by helping people solve problems. He runs his own company called Summon Jack Rural Research Training and project support. We are indeed privileged to have Mr. Dabula with us today, especially considering that it took him the best part of a day and a half to travel from his home to Cape Town. Mr. Dabula. <laughs> I am Kagatile Tabula. Molweni Nonke, Gokshia Shiana Quest Salon as Tulo Zenu. I greet you all of you in different chairs and positions. I am so proud to be recognized by HWFOT, which made it possible for me to come and participate. I am talking to you about the impact of occupational therapy research. I live in Mount Frey in Alfred and Zoo, Eastern Cape, where you see the green star. Ah, it's yeah, the green star. <laughs> <laughs> I belong to Kosa people and the Baka tribe. Sia Boba, Sia Sefula, it's Baka. Our language is only found in this part of the country. I have worked as a research assistant in deep rural areas since 2000. I have helped researchers from public health, land reforms, and the occupational therapy. People make their houses with clay bricks. They fetch water from the rivers. They collect wood and dung for fuel because there is no electricity. Transport is expensive. 
There is high unemployment and social problems like substance abuse and domestic violence. There are good schools, health and social services are available at clinics. Some of studies I have helped you with uh, poverty, disability, and occupation. What services think about services deli service delivery for people with disability? Attitudes of community members and service providers towards disability, the occupations of citizenship, disability policy literacy, and citizen activism. We invited the whole community, including people with disability. Many headmen traveled a few hours on horseback to attend the workshops. They took the information back to their own village. We worked with, we worked with village health workers and some traditional healers. We also included disability service providers from different sectors and the rehabilitation therapist. It was important to communicate properly by talking first to people in authority before we talk to individuals. It was also important to talk to everyone in community gathering for people's question could be answered. It was important to give feedback of our findings to the community and other stakeholders like service providers. We acted ethically by using participatory ethics with the community and informed consent with individuals. We used research methods like interviews, Q methodology, rural mapping, participatory, participatory, participatory action workshops, the occupation therapy, and I also trained health workers in disability screening. We linked the health workers with the South African People's Health Movement. We provided sewing machines, carpentry tools, and training for income generations. We helped people at wheelchairs, crutches, and counseling. I assisted the studies with the research administration, community entry, informed consent, communication with tribal authority, village research advisory group, and service providers. I also provided language translation and cultural interpretation. The research changes people's knowledge and power. Two years after the study ended, the tribal authority and the research advisory group called to service providers to a gathering of, 50, of 500 people to explain their service needs and plan action. Parents and teachers started including of, disab of, disab of disabled children in local schools. Tribal authority made sure people with disabilities got jobs with extended public works programs. Health workshops started teaching other health workers in other villages about disability. I learned how to clean research data, explain things to researchers, explain cultural codes, explain the research usefully to community. For example, cleaning research data is like ukuketa ipela there's no explaining an idiom in Kosa. <laughs> Basically, it's taking a cockroach out of milk. That's a direct translation. <laughs> <laughs> but what he means is, as you see in the picture there, that's a direct translation of taking the cockroach out of milk. It's a direct translation. So how... I how you, how, what Mr. Clark means is learn how to take out unnecessary details so that he can give clear answer to questions asked by researchers. I learned to explain things to researchers 
so that they can understand what is really going on. For example, when we, when we investigate what people do every day, we see that they appear to be busy, but they are actually only doing for the sake of doing. The researchers do not notice this. Then I say, but is the calf of a cow. At night, you separate the calf and cow so that they can milk the cow in the morning. Then in the morning, if you don't want to milk the cow, you just let the calf go straight through the mother so he can suckle. Ukutkritisa means to allow him to pass, to allow the calf to go to its mother. Your job is to milk the cow. Instead, you're just letting the calf through the milk. So ukutkritisa itole I learned how to explain cultural codes and I taught them how to behave in my community so that they did not offend the people, the people or the ancestors. In Kosa, one word can have many different meanings depending on the situation and who is speaking. There are also many beliefs in Bata culture that are different for outside people to understand. Again, it's the same thing. You can cook soup in you can't cook soup in many kitchens, um, which means you can have one one house, different problems, but it, but it means you can solve one problem in a different in all many houses. Wagunima. <laughs> It was hard for me to translate across four different languages. I had to listen and speak Sipata and English. I had to learn what occupational therapy words mean and help people understand what information was shared. I had to interpret cultural codes like people's belief in ancestors. It was difficult for me as a man to ask some question depending on the person's age and gender. It was also hard to explain white people to the community. <laughs> <laughs> I have some advice for OTs. Anyone who wants to work with the villages is welcomed anytime. They must be obedient calm, kind, harmonious, and wise. They must be keen to attend activities of the communities. Each district must have OT official. <laughs> they must get more funding for rural research. They must get government to give bursaries to students from villages. <laughs> With SPAC, we brought light. Rural research by occupational therapy will impact live people. It sparked people's knowledge. I thank you. So we're living up to the expectation here. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Rabula. We now have two grandmothers, Mama Daisy and Mama Tandi, from the non-profit group organization, GARPA, which stands for Grandmothers Against Poverty and AIDS. They are located in Kayalicha. They were nominated by the grandmothers at GARPA 
to share something of the heart and soul of this organization. First up to address us is my Daisy, as she is affectionately known, who joined the GARPA team in 2014 and plays an active role in overseeing and visiting community groups. She has been married for 45 years. Isn't that amazing? And together, she and her husband are raising two of their five grandchildren. She has years of experience and training in counseling and providing support to individuals and groups of people diagnosed or affected by HIV and AIDS. My Daisy. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Daisy. I'm from an organization called GAPA. And GAPA stands for Grandmothers Against Poverty and AIDS. In 2001, GAPA started um, by 10 grandmothers and Kathleen Prodericks, one of the OTs, uh, the children of the grandmothers were died of AIDS. And the grandmothers didn't know why their children died. They diagnosed to the clinics, and it was very difficult to them to disclose to their parents. There was a lack of knowledge. That is where Kathy started uh, to educate about um, the HIV and AIDS in Kailicha and run the workshops. The purpose of GAPA is to support infected and affected um, grandmothers and the children in the community emotionally, physically, and practically. Services offered at GAPA is the support groups, health club, radio slot, indaba, aftercare, and income generation. the support group. We have 18 support groups in the community. It is done by the group leaders, the, the group leaders. They do craft work, the garden, sewing, and they share during their meetings, they share their issues as the older person. My role is to visit all these groups, strengthen the groups, educational sessions, assess the situation of the groups, and refer to GAPA, clinics, and other NGOs if necessary. The health club, the health club has 40 grandmothers. They, um, they, they do um, their sessions on a Tuesdays. Their club happens on a Tuesdays every week. They do exercise, education about health, speak out, sharing their issues, networking with the clinics and the, the hospitals. That is the health club, the radio slot. Every Wednesdays, I go to the radio for community awareness and educational sessions. 
to inform the community on campus event. Um, our Indaba. When we have Indaba, we invite the guest speaker to give the topic for that day. And also, we invite um, more partners in our community so they can attend the Indaba. So when the guest speaker is talking about the, the, the topic, so we share information uh, with the partners and all the people in your community, in our community, that is Indaba. Um, after care, currently there are 150 children registered at our aftercare and five aftercare teachers. They take good care on, on, on our children and um, we also have African impact volunteers that are attending um, in our center from Monday to Thursday. They play a huge role. They play with children, teaching, organizing the outing for the children and the grannies. Um, our children also have sessions, storytellings. We are trying to teach them to speak out so that they, they can express themselves. And they also have uh, the session about um, girls and boys talk. We also have um, four grannies, the staff members that are cooking for the children. After school, when the children are coming from school, then they go to the aftercare, the grannies cook for them, and the children enjoy that because some of them they come from with empty stomach in the morning. So I think um, uh, GAPA plays a huge role on that. Um, <laughs> the income generation. GAPA provides um, provide skills for grandmothers staff members, and the children. Because we do garden, craft work, we do sewing, crocheting, knitting, and also beaded. I thank you. Special grandmothers, not a note in front of her. No. <laughs> Fantastic, my Daisy. <laughs> Matandi is originally from Alice, a small town in the Eastern Cape, and came to Kailicha in 1985. She joined the educational workshops at GARPA in 2009 and is currently offering her love and support as a teacher in the aftercare section at GARPA. She is a grandmother and caregiver of two beautiful boys. Her passion is to care for the people of her community and she enjoys singing and dancing. Matandi. Mm -hmm. 
you're so welcome. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Sunny Bonani. Hey, I'm so happy to be here. My name is Tandy. I'm one of the grannies in Kappa. I joined Kappa 2009. I was sitting lonely in my house, and my neighbor invited me and said, instead of sitting here, don't you want to come and join at Kappa and see what's happening there? Then I say, what is Kappa? Because I never heard anything about Kappa. But I decided to follow her. I did follow her. When I get in there, I feel the feeling this is another place because I feel so happy inside. And day one, we go to learn about the garden. I was born and bred in a rural areas. It's where I learned how to plow the mealies, all those things. And I was so happy to see ah, the garden in Cape Town. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> and then the second day, they taught us about a parenting skill. It's something so important because we've got grandchildren to look after them. And it's when I learn, ah, oh, parenting skill. Hey, these things are funny here in Cape Town. They're not like they where I'm from. And another day, they were teaching us about the human's right. Each and everybody's got the right. They've got the right to have a place to live, got the right to have food to eat, We've got the right to, clothe, to have clothes on her body or his body. Then I said, wow. These things. And then I tell myself, it's wonderful to be here. There comes day four about HIV and AIDS. The woman who was teaching about HIV, she was so passionate about it. And then I was sitting silently listening and saying, HIV and AIDS. He continued and talk about HIV. It's where it clicks on my mind, wow. Where did I hear about this word, HIV and AIDS? It's the day when the doctor diagnosed my sister that your sister is dying of HIV and AIDS. I say, what? It's today I learn about this, and then I tell myself, not a single person from my family will die of HIV and AIDS, because today, at GAPA, I'm learning about this, this disease. It's not a disease to see someone to see that. It's inside your body. Be proud to be HIV and AIDS. If you take your medication, 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 medication. If you treat HIV like a baby, it will take care of you. You must take care of it. Because if the baby is crying, the baby will cry. If HIV is telling you, now it's a time for AR ARVs, take your ARVs. Don't hide it. Just be clear to everybody, I'm living with HIV and AIDS, and I'm not scared of it. Because if you are living with sugar diabetic, if you do not take your medication, you are going to die. High blood, you are going to die. Medication comes first. And don't be scared of a stigma. No, because when you're scared of a stigma, it's where you're going to start not taking your medication. And you default. After default, it's a grave. You're going to die. That is what I tell my family. If you go to hospital and they say to you, you are living with HIV and AIDS, be proud. Don't even have a fear to say, what is that? No, be proud so that you can teach the others. And I'm there to support each and everybody who's living with HIV and AIDS. It's because of Kappa. Because Kappa taught me a lot about it. And then there's a circle there. The grannies are making the circle. It's where they share their problems. You think you've got the problem more than the others? No. Think again. <laughs> there are people who've got more problems than yours. And they share on that. It's a safe space to share each and every problem. 
It's not going to go out. It ends there. After that, the grannies start praying and singing. And you can see them. They start to move and dancing. It shows they are happy. It's their healing. It's a part of healing. Singing is a part of our healing. Dancing. And what I like, I just learned something. On Monday, about this kappa, uh, uh, kappa, they say, did you ever take a flight? I say, wow, I never take a flight. <laughs> and they say, today, you're going to go to Johannesburg. Ha, I was happy like a baby. <laughs> I was happy like a baby. And I was sitting in between the people of Vets University. I'm proud of Kappa. I'm proud of Kappa. You know what was happening there? They were talking about the problems of the grannies, the pension money. There are challenges outside there about their money, the grant money. They were giving a loans. Not supposed to have a loan. On an age of 86, how can you have a loan? How are you going to pay that? You have to enjoy your money. Because of God, I was there in the middle talking <laughs> and advise the others. You see? That is why I'm so proud of the lady uh, called Kathleen Brodericks. She was the one, an <laughs> OT. OT, forward with the OTs, forward, forward with the OTs, forward, because that lady, she's an OT, she challenges the clinics at Kylie Chas. she never feared anything, and do some research about this, this, this HIV, and she did the research after that, she decided to call all the clinics to put them together and say, the struggle is, is, is on of HIV. Let's go to the community and do a word of mouth. Word of mouth is so powerful. Because when I go to my house and say, where you come from? What's the meaning of this t-shirt? I say, all right, let me explain to you. What is the meaning of this t-shirt? I'm proud of this t-shirt because it's a spade to get whatever you get and you still have time to learn. And I was also doing a, a, a office work. Can you believe it? I'm not educated. But I was busy in Kathleen's a, 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 a organization doing the office work. And I'm proud of myself. I'm not educated, but I'm a strong person. I'm a strong, I'm an ion. I'm a strong person. What I want to tell you is that singing, dancing, that is the main thing to us. I'm proud to be a GAPA member. I thank you very much.
Daisy, Matandi, Maxwell, Rakatile, thank you from the bottom of my heart. I think that this has been a wonderful, wonderful session. And I think the response of our audience indicates how much they have enjoyed and hopefully learned from your presentations today. Thank you so much. <laughs>